you know something about SysBot, you're in the right place. Uh, so yeah, in this case, I do not really have much to That's uh, fine. tell more. So yeah, but I uh, requested this big live session is to hear some experience, some maybe ideas. Like if you're have had to deal with SysBot reports where you can tell us your pain and what we can do to relieve it. If you have not had to debug SysBot issues, but you have, still have experience with kernel, just, just share what uh, tools, what information, in your opinion, is most helpful in determining the um, actual cause of a problem. And yeah, and also whatever yeah, ideas and opinions you have regarding SysBot operation, kernel filing, also. I think these are supposed to be also recorded, or yeah, it's being recorded. We are supposed to use this uh, pulse. I think. Yep. Yeah. So if there's questions or comments, and uh, well, I have a thing to do. Uh, if you're on chat, if you're remote, then uh, just un just share your video to let you let us know that you wanted to say something. I'll send a message. Uh, just sent a message. Okay. So, uh, just a general question with the the fuzzing: Are there any tests that actually try to, instead of making it fail, try to make it take as long as possible, um, and actually, like, even if it doesn't actually error out, to try and um, basically like tank latency? Um, mm. As a method of testing, I'm just curious. During uh, normal fuzzer operations, yeah, we do actually mostly focus on covering as much kernel as kernel as possible. So we, we do not. I think we, we should not expect the kernel to crash at all. But at least during fuzzing, we do not assume that it crashes at every every single syscall. So we generate programs. We mm, see that we have covered new parts of the kernel. We yeah. try to actually minimize the generate a program so that we could still cover the same new part of the kernel and we remember that program. Yeah. And then it goes on like this. So okay. we get more and more programs that cover more and more of the kernel. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So uh, source lines of code is basically your metric uh, and time. Blocks, I'd say. It's per block or in Clang, it's uh, per link coverage or how it's called. Oh. But yeah, basically the amount of source code that's that we could have man that we have managed to execute, and bugs are just a side effect of uh, executing that code. Yeah. Cool. Maybe to break the ice with some uh, <laughs> thoughts I have on uh, uh, improving the debuggability of some sysbot reports. Uh, one topic that I find interesting would be tracing of reproducers. So, okay, two, two parts. Uh, in the case where you have a reproducer, providing a trace, an F-trace trace, or some amount of um, trace that helps the debugger understand what gets mm -hmm. um, tickled by the reproducer. And then in the case where we do not have a reproducer, uh, doing fuzzing, if we were using some of the uh, Intel PT or some of the hardware-assisted tracing, features to log the last n branches in some CP ring buffer. Um, even if we can't reproduce the bug, we will be able to attach some metadata that say, yeah, this led to the bug and uh, augment the bug trace and provide maybe some more context to the, um, uh, the developers who then look into the bugs. I don't know, just wild ideas. If anyone knows more about these topics or finds it interesting or not, or <laughs> We uh, at least did get requests to add uh, a trace output. So we and we tried to do that after we had generated a reproducer. We run it under S trace and we share the results. It should help. But I think here the intention was to better understand what the reproducer is actually doing because these color kind of programs can be quite convoluted, fortunately. Uh, but tracing, yes, I think it can be, but. Like if you only provide this list of offices, I don't know how much it would be of help. 
one of the ideas that was has been already proposed quite a long time ago actually was to collect uh, kernel memory dumps at the moment of the crash so that you could uh, attach you could run JDB against that memory and the DM Linux to get some more insight into what was the state of the kernel at the moment when the problem happened to see at least all stack traces for all um, kernel threads to see the values of global variables and so on. I think it, so what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Are you using these kernel dumps in practice? Do you find them helpful? At least at, what, from what I tried, uh, it works, I think, most of the time. But at times, the kernel has very complicated structures. I don't know, some balanced trees. And uh, good luck with traversing those with JDB. By, by kernel dumps, you mean the, the actual kernel image used in the test? Uh, or? The uh, RAM content. RAM content. Okay. okay, no, no, I haven't used that. Sometimes I've used the, the, the actual kernel image to do post-mortem uh, static analysis of the bug, and that was really helpful for some of them, mm -hmm. but no, no dumps. So, so we regularly use k dumps, like when we are analyzing customer issues, for example. So when something goes wrong, we trigger k dump and then analyze it post mortem. So, so and and there is like relatively wide infrastructure for actually doing this, uh, even like parsing the complex data structures. Like there are uh, there are ways how you can now, now you have like the crash utility, which is which has some useful tools for actually traversing the. The data structures also there are various python bindings for this so you can actually write a python program to actually process dk dump you know and do the parsing so i wouldn't be afraid but i'm concerned of is that if you capture some kind of like qmu dump or whatever yeah uh it's going to take a lot of space so it, it may be like how i could imagine is that like you know if someone starts to investigating he could kind of like ask, you know, please reproduce this, reproduce this for me and get me the K dump. Yeah. Like, and on this like per request basis, I could imagine it would be useful. And so, because otherwise you would be spending like terabytes and terabytes of space on K dumps nobody's interested in. Uh, so like given the amount of bugs you find. <laughs> yeah, the K dumps, I think it could be actually, I don't know, could be more helpful probably for bugs for which you do not have a reproducer uh, because that's why every I think extra bit of information counts but I don't know given the number of bugs with reproducers probably like, nobody just cares about those without yeah so I agree that for those that for which you don't have reproducers they would be kind of interesting but then yes it's yeah I, I agree actually yeah so so you could maybe but like if it's one one off, yeah, then then I guess there is no, not much change to the bucket either. Like you would have to basically generate KDAM for everything, yeah, that, which I don't think is really feasible. But uh, like you know, if it is like if you see you can trigger it, just you cannot get to the reproducers, then I agree that getting KDAM would be probably useful. But again, I th think that it would be like more on a per request basis, like that you know. I'm hitting this, so I would be, in, and I'm interested in debugging this. Please get me K dump of this issue would be really useful, I believe. But because one K dump is going to have a few gigabytes, and you could perhaps compress it, but still, given the rate you, with which you hit the bugs. <laughs> yeah, I think if, at least if we keep like one, two K dumps for every bug then per month or something, it should be reasonable. Yeah, okay. At least okay. for disk images and VM Linux files, we do store them for oh, quite a long true. time and they can be compressed pretty well. Mm -hmm. Maybe with KDump, I think it should be even better. The kernel memory is anyway not that big. And mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, If it's feasible, then it, it would be useful in some cases, definitely. Yeah. Another thing, uh, so Dan Carperton already mentioned it and that's, that's also a thing that's Kind of, I'm thinking about it on and off whether how this bot could do is 
and it's it's kind of this uh, like root only versus like arbitrary user uh, distinction. Yeah. So so the question is basically it's a question of prioritiz prioritization of the bugs reported by Sysbot, which is also like kind of a way how we deal with it because currently there is not enough like maintainer slash developer bandwidth to to address all of the reported issues. Uh, and so, so, so it's basically a question of prioritization, but I can like leave there kind of <laughs> bit rotting and what, what should be really addressed soon because it's a real potentially security issue and stuff like this, because this is actually causing the stress. Sysbot report comes, you don't know whether it's actually CVE worthy <laughs> issue or whether it's just some like normal bug, which is good to fix, but not really pressing. Yeah. And if you have to spend a few days in, in the worst case, like even longer, the best case, perhaps less, but if you have to spend simply like a good chunk of time to identify whether this is just something stupid, like bad assertion or whether it is something fundamental, then yeah, that, that can kind of contributes to the stress. So if we, for example, immediately known this is only possible to trigger as root, then, uh, then we can like deprioritize this back. And if, or if we know that it is triggerable as an ordinary user, then yeah, we, we would, we should be giving it a higher priority because it's like more likely a security issue. And the question is how to do this in an automated way, because yeah, I, I understand it's not completely trivial. Yes because there are setup steps uh, which need to be performed as, as root in every case. So there are a lot of such cases actually for file systems, I think we can only for, it. Uh, absolutely. So, sorry. System and do, so do yeah, root and do something from user. Is it a root only bug or is a user? Only exactly. Bug? Yeah. I, I understand it's not easy. I understand it's not easy from the sysbot point of view. Like you would have to have basically some, let's say decent, decently behaved stuff which is done as a setup as root and then you go go wild as an ordinary user yeah but uh, yeah how to implement this yeah, i don't under, i don't see the details how, how you would do this <laughs> but just there is a feeling that somehow we should be able to to get better in this like being able to discern whether we require root access or not for a particular issue But yeah, I, I fully agree. I think it could be very useful uh, triaging signal for yeah. people. But yeah, the idea of how to exactly implement it, I think yeah. it's really tricky. Uh, I think for at least for networking, where we do set up networking devices before doing the actual fuzzing, mm -hmm. it's somewhat more straightforward because we can easily split actually all the execution, the first part that yeah, we create devices, set up networks, whatever. Um, then we use job privileges and do other stuff. But at least during, in, for file systems, I think it's not that obvious because mount operations and other operations, they can all be in arbitrary order. It's not that we always have to mount first and then do something mm -hmm. else later. Yeah. It's, I'm just thinking, yeah, I, I don't have a good solution either. It's just a kind of a wish. <laughs> On that same topic, I think once we discuss this and you say that uh, what we can do is also have two instances of fuzzing, one that fuzzes root, one that fuzzes unprivileged. And if you get uh, a bug from unprivileged and you know for sure, okay, this one can be triggered from non-root, definitely. Do we have uh, such instances running already? Still, uh, for file systems, I think we would get zero bugs. On yeah, you will get zero bugs, of course, but the bugs you do get, you know 100% they are. Uh, no, so far we've not. Because uh, it's not That's... a full solution to the problem, but it's a, but it's, a step yeah, it's, in the it's, direction. It's and it's a solution, I think. Easy. Uh, what else was... Uh, Proposed. There is also I think, KJDB in the kernel mm -hmm. that lets you dump 
a lot of the information about the kernel state. I guess it's some maybe a better lightweight version of but instead of uh, dumping the memory and letting developer later run GDB to connect that memory with the VM Linux file. Another way is to use the KGDB tool that can start that starts working after the kernel after the panic and provides some command line interface that allow, lets the person or the bot to send some commands and store the output of the some kernel global state at uh, the moment of the panic. And have you been using, have you ever used it in, in practice and seen it? Could it be helpful? At least we saw requests from USB people that, okay, we want to see information about all the USB devices at the moment the kernel crashed. And that seemed like the option that could be used at least by extending KJDB by, by adding some show USB devices command. So I think KDAM would kind of solve this as well. Like if, if you give them KDAM, then they could figure out how to how to get all the USB devices out of the KDAM pair. And, and it's like what we deal with when we do customer requests anyway. So I guess it's like people tend to have tools for this, how to extract this from the KDAMP. So I guess KDAMP so, so solve these kind of special requests. <coughs> Yeah, I think KDAMP is a, a more general solution. Uh, I think the, the problem goes how to share that with a bunch of people. V VM cores can be large, especially from bare metal systems. Uh, uh, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, with uh, KDAMP VM cores, people can use whatever tools they are used uh, use it to use to analyze either Crash or a Dragon or whatever. So I think it's a broader solution than uh, KDB. By the way, uh, uh, I may uh, have under understood uh, wrong, but do you guys fuzz only virtual machines or also uh, physical servers as well? Because some sort of weird bugs just uh, arise on physical machines, different architectures, etc. cetera. Uh, at least we ourselves uh, only fuzz on virtual machines. We fuzz mentioned on Google Cloud virtual machines and on camel instances. Uh, but other people do, you, do use, definitely do use this color to find some hardware problems. But uh, yeah, of course, it's also a very promising direction because the, we care has a lot of drivers. And even, even if we have descriptions for their kernel interfaces, there is very little point in fuzzing them without having the actual devices. And therefore, we have barely any coverage for device for drivers at Sysbot. But it also comes at their own costs. Because like with virtual machine, it's easy. We have created it, we have mangled it, and we just drop it. But with hardware, um, it's not that we probably want to reflash this whole image every time it crashed. Get more interesting. So yeah, do you have any other questions, feedback, ideas? So for me, being able to reliably reproduce the issue is critical because then we can live debug it using QMU or whatever. So uh, previous issues that we've faced in the past is not being able to reproduce the issue due to the different tooling we use compared with what you use. Do you provide a hermetic way to download the entire build system image, et cetera, so like a Docker image that you can download so we can ensure that your all of the tooling versions are the same? Uh, we do share uh, the bootable disk image now. Uh, with every report, you can download it and uh, just directly run Camel using it. It will be exactly the same image, that's exactly the same kernel that Sysbot was using. So that's the file system and the kernel already pre-built. But what about if you then want to rebuild things? 
we want to rebuild here. That's then it's a bit more interesting, but uh, our Docker container is public, uh, the one we use for syscaller. And uh, the two, uh, the, we share the kernel config that we used to build the kernel. And actually the tool itself uh, that can build the kernel uh, exactly the way syscaller does and uh, inject it into a disk image exactly like syscaller does. It's also there, but that one is unfortunately not very well documented mm. at this point. You used to also produce or um, distribute the uh, compiler that you used, but you stopped doing that? Uh, now they're all in the Docker container. Okay, so the Docker container is the answer to that? Yes. Okay, all right, I'll start using that. It's turned out to be much easier. Cool. One idea, so you said also you do like k-config minimization for the bisection and stuff like this. Do you share anywhere the minimized k-config, like as part of a reproducer minimization, which you do anyway, like you could also minimize the k-config and then, then share that <laughs> because it makes the reproduction and analysis sometimes simpler as well. Yeah. So as if you do it anyway for the bisection, then it might be interesting. Uh... Yeah, this after we have finished the section, I think we do share the config. Oh, okay. Used for that best section, but uh, it's I think more of an architectural uh, issue because reproducers are found by syscaller, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and syscaller operates with only one specific kernel image, and uh, by sections are done by sysbot, and sysbot can afford actually building mm -hmm. the kernel each time with different configurations different revisions and uh, preparing these images and running tall. Mm -hmm. So we have we had some plans to try to move back reproduction also to Sysbot. If we do that, I think it should become possible. We do not minimize it 100% uh, because it's it's also a tricky business. It's the <laughs> diff between some baseline config and the config that we use is very big. And mm -hmm. if there is just one config, to enable, it would already take, I think, maybe 20, uh, 20, 10, 15 steps. But usually there are several configs and it just explodes the number of iterations. We would need to find them exactly those configs. Mm -hmm. So what we do for bisection, we uh, do it partially. We uh, think on average, we do think five or six iterations and the diff between baseline and the config that we use for building the kernel, it gets smaller, I think, 4x or something like that. It, it, it noticeably increases build times already. Yeah. <laughs> and not, and uh, yeah, lets us trigger fewer side problems as well. OK. Yeah, yeah. Have, well, yeah, that's a very reasonable suggestion. Yeah, it was just that, for example, when I am reproducing and so I, I you know, test the exact config sometimes, you know, and say, okay, it's built. So I basically do the minimization by hand because then I'm, if I don't have immediately the idea of what's going wrong, I need to reproduce it, you know, add some debugging outputs, you know, recompile the kernel and so on. So it's easier if I, so I sometimes also minimize the k-config before it to kind of. <laughs> so configs are very big. I think it's maybe on 64 core machine. It takes maybe five, 10 minutes. Yeah, the yeah. Machine is smaller and proportionally bigger. <laughs> uh, and regarding reproducibility, um, uh, yes, it's I think another part of the problem is that for Linux, mostly we use Google Cloud VMs, uh, and we reproduce also using them. And I think in some cases, your producer does depend on the specific timings, performance, uh, which is, of course, and you take even the same kernel image and run it using Camo, they will be different. And the reproduction just doesn't work. I've seen a very regularly see such cases. Unfortunately, I'm not sure how much can be done for that. Maybe we could explain. Explicitly, just try to run the reproducer on Camo and to understand if it works there. Uh, 
still think for many uh, uh, issues caused by races, yeah, we're missing some functionality to reliably uh, produce the same threat interleaving to trigger exactly the same problem. We just have to rely on luck to that our reproducer would hit the problem that somehow they it would all come together so that the correct execution execution path becomes possible. You want to say something? <laughs> Um, so question about uh, bisecting. How far back do you go? So if you find a problem, do you, how far back do you go to determine whether or not the problem always existed or whether it started somewhat recently? Uh, when we are bisecting for the box origin, uh, we first actually go revision by revision back. And major or minor or how? Uh, it depends. If uh, there are a lot of minor revisions, we skip them, of course. So I don't know, for Android or for some that can be based on some LTS, there can be, I think, hundreds of uh, these sub revisions. Of course, we, it's a waste of time to test them all. So we at least uh, always go back to two digits, like five, uh, six, seven, six, 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 five, and so on. Um, it works. So at least uh, when we go back and test every, I don't know, would you call it major? Would you call it major release? Well, I would call that major minor. But so so yeah, we try every major minor release right. uh, going from now to history, and when we see that it no longer crashes, then we consider that we have we have found the the section range. Do you start to accelerate that range if you get to the beginning of a major release and it's still there? Like, uh, like for example, if you go six seven down to six zero and then it's still there, then jump to five zero and then four zero and like maybe yeah, eventually... we start skipping, then skip one, then skip two. Right. Okay, so you do start accelerating to yes. It's... So it sounds like this is somewhat of a manual selection process to be able to figure out how to start looking for the original uh, or an earlier known good? Uh, well, it's, uh, of course, it's all automated, but the, con the exact parameters that were chosen, chosen they, were, they were not very, maybe not very sound, but just the ones that seemed to work well. Uh, and I'm, it's the problem, of course, of time. I guess I, guess I should still continue using this. Um, so I'm guessing that there must be some that you found where you never found a known good in the past. So you basically went back to 2.6 or even earlier, and it was always there. Yes, in that right. case, we just don't do resection. We say that okay, it okay. happens on the oldest test that released, and it's, I think we the maximum we can do is 4. Dot something. Oh, okay. Okay, but, so I guess that's that, that's sort of a reverse of bisection is to, to start widening your net to try and get further and further back to find it. It's not widening. It's, it's anyway, the range is it's the same because we need to know that the next revision failed. Right. Uh, and the version and the really major minor release before that worked well. Is the range is not big, but sure. Technically, the range is getting a sure. bit bigger. But so yeah, ahead. but once you found a known good, then you bisect. But the process of trying to find an original known good is sort of the reverse of bisecting, where you're widening your net. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but uh, that works just if we try it, because the smaller the range is, the yeah, so uh, yeah obviously, yeah. Your chances okay. to make a mistake. But that answers my question: is you basically only go back to four dot whatever if but that's that's what you currently. It's a rare case, do. actually. It's right. The most of the issues are in recent releases because they get. Sure. Like yeah. we fixed our time. Because some of the bugs that I've looked at, I've ended up uh, looking back and, and used some of the, the rebuilt histories so that it basically concatenates three different Git trees to be able to get a history that goes back to you know, like 0 0.95 and even, you know, really, really early kernels and was able to find stuff that's always been there. 
like it was the very first check-in of that feature had that bug. Anyway. Yeah, that part. Sorry? I said the NSA is not happy with you. <laughs> That's their prerogative. <laughs> <laughs> The sections were, of course, 100 percent reliable. We could probably just yeah, start at the first commit, <laughs> the last commit, and then do it from that. That would take a while. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, going through revisions also takes a while. You mm -hmm. think if there were infinite time, we could have yeah, tested more major miners, but we just have to balance the time we're ready to spend doing the section. So, you, so you've never gone back to you know 0 0.11 kernel. Or... I think we won't compile it and won't <laughs> test it anyway. <laughs> All right, who wants the mic? Hmm? Anyone else wants to add something? It was discussed. Uh, in the meanwhile, yeah, I've just put to uh, go back to the pre presentation that was just given. That yeah, I personally found it surprising that indeed so many issues that we do find on LTS and all the kernels are actually already fixed. And this is, of course, here I think in this conference probably most com people are interested in the mainline, but for all companies who are actually using it in their products, they all use older kernels. And it's surprising how many fixes do not really reach all kernels that they were really, really affected. There was a, there was a comment by Rick Van Riel uh, on the chat during your talk, actually, that uh, there are uh, like sometimes what happens in the stable is that so, some of the patches are cherry picked, but some of the prerequisites prerequisites are omitted, which introduces essentially new bugs into st just the stable version. Another variant of this is that like, you know, there is something after the branching point, uh, you, you cherry pick some of the, some fix. But then there is a follow-up fix-up, which actually doesn't get properly, uh, which doesn't get backported, or maybe doesn't get back, like backported yet to the stable tree. Yeah, it depends. So, so actually, the breakage point is behind, uh, like after the merge base. So merge base would be fine, but uh, so, but yeah, this will kind of appear as a stable specific breakage essentially. Yeah, so. These are uh, these are some of the occasions where where it can happen. But yeah, I was kind of surprised that it's really that they are really upstream fixes that are not getting into stable. But it may be probably one of the per subsystem kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> I understand you didn't want to be controversial, but uh, like maybe it would be interesting to see like whether there is any concentration in particle file system like where, where, where this happens like whether they, they should be getting better in setting the fixes text properly or something like that as we're more active in demanding that fix patches have fixed stack yeah yeah easier. well that, that's sometimes yeah exactly so it's basically up to the maintainer to to like enforce that fixes have fixes tech. Yeah. So obviously we have always the case, as you mentioned, that you know we fix something and we don't realize that. Yeah, that's that's always the case and that's well that will always happen. It's simply a mistake. <laughs> uh, so so we will never be perfect, but yeah, at least if we commit a known fix, then we should strive for either explicitly CCing stable or, or in the ideal case, I think a fix is tech as well. Yeah. So if, if there is concentration in the particle, of, obviously even in this, like mistakes happen, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, if, if there is particle sub subsystem, which is bad as it is, then yeah, we could maybe talk to those people. 
the ones that we found that we will so try to actually help those commits get into stables. Yeah, yeah, that, so, of course that would be nice. Like, like uh, as you said, you could do since you have now the automation that you could basically out automatically, you know, report that you know we have identified that this fixes this is what reproducer, and uh, see this stable kernel should probably pick it up. Yeah. It's... This still requires manual analysis when I was analyzing the results that I got. It's was it's not so straightforward to understand. Uh, Looking at the commit from a subsystem unknown to me, <laughs> to uh, understand how to classify it. Is it a correct result or? Yeah, so I absolutely agree, but as a kind of last resort thing, like it shouldn't be like the standard process, I would say, but as last resort thing to catch, catch mistakes, I, I guess it's, it's still nice, nice automation to have, but yeah. As I said, like ideally reach out to the maintainers if they could improve in the with the fixes like that would be also a way to go if there is any particle concentration in any particular subsystem. This work, if you're interested, these lists are actually public. Go to the dashboard, there is a special page that lists um, all commits from torvalds that need to be backported to what particular LTS branch. History. The POF sessions are 45 minutes. So, is this missing backports? Yeah, missing backports. Yes. backports, yes. We've got about five minutes left, but you don't have to use Yes, of course. So, if, so are there any, is there anyone else who wants to add something? What we discussed, what we have not yet discussed. And thank you very much for coming. Let's have our five minutes back. Yeah, so I can see, for example, I found here one like EXT4 issue, but that was actually CC into stable kernel org, just probably it didn't get picked up by the stable tree because of uh, yeah, there are maybe different cases for an... no, I'm sorry. So, so for example, we have this one, yeah? and uh, I'm kind of I'm not sure if the oh 515 it didn't get applied. I see. Yeah, so, so, you know, it was CC to mm -hmm. stable, apparently. Often they don't apply, though, and Greg just kicks them out. And then unless uh, someone is prepared to do uh, the backboard. Yeah, so probably, probably it didn't just apply because of some context changes. Uh, There's no fixes tag either, so you don't know which kernels that will and will, will not be. Oh, yeah, to. but this is, this is likely basically very, very close, all the back. <laughs> So, so I think it was triggered on that 515. It's uh, it's goes yeah. from box that it found on LTS to mainline. So oh, it's yeah, not sure. the other way around. Yeah, I understand. So in 515, it was still a problem, but like yes. the, like the fixes tag here wouldn't mm. really help that much because you know it would go somewhere to 4.0 or 3.12 or somewhere yeah? <laughs> like this. So, so like yes, you would know that it applies. But basically, yeah, it didn't apply probably because of some context changes and then, then yeah. you know. And it would have stopped there as well. It wouldn't have gone back to four. So Greg doesn't apply it to four unless it's gone into five. Yeah. Otherwise, when people upgrade their kernel, you get regressions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, so, so that, that's kind of, there was not enough, nobody was interested enough to actually act on the failed. They need some place to gather all that stuff, I think. Failed application. Yes. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's, 515 it's not i think it's it sounds old but i think for many companies it would be actually new that's one yeah. of our, that's one of our newer kernels right? yeah well, <laughs> you maintain for <laughs> <laughs> like and, and of course also newer ones like 513 and 6.4 and so on but 5.3 as well whatever yeah i agree that, yeah. and does anybody care about just normal stable trees or 
Well, yes. So, so we we have our private ones, but like, for example, like yeah, Android that yeah, basically feeds from standard stable yeah, trees. Yeah, we care. Yeah, and uh, other vendors, I believe as well, like like of handset vendors. Yeah, I was going to come and say hello. <laughs> you right? It's good talk. Enjoy. Yeah, no, this is actually one of my pics. Yeah, when I see a person on the on VC and on the pictures, it's hard to. Yeah, yeah. I've also grown my hair and grown a beard, so <laughs> you wouldn't recognize me from my old out. But I was going to come and say hello anyway. Oh yeah, okay. So, so this is a case of a. This is actually one of the my pics, <laughs> and it was just a performance issue there. So, yeah, we didn't actually see C it's too stable or anything because we didn't seem really serious enough. But apparently you were able to trigger a hung task with it if you stressed enough. <laughs> like because apparently the performance was so bad that if you stressed the kernel enough, you were hitting hung task and identified that the performance fix actually fixes the problem. Okay. Yeah. So it's one of the kind of you know miss Where are you looking? I don't recognize that format. Upstream backports, what's that? Yes, it's on the web dashboard. If you navigate to it, there will be at the top the header the mm -hmm. button missing backports. Oh, okay. And if you log in with your Google account, you will see more. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Um, yeah, I mean, I can start chaining through those. Mm -hmm. if I can start fixing those, mm -hmm. doing the, doing, going through and doing the backports. That's what I've been doing anyway with Greg. Uh, so if I find that, because uh, Greg's got a real low, low bar, if it doesn't automatically cherry pick, he won't go ahead and fix it. Mm -hmm. He'll report it to the author and, and often they don't care. So then I would have, then have to go and fix it and back forward and do that. So I don't know how great it looks like and where it is there. I talked to Sasha even, mm -hmm. and he said, yeah, just can send me uh, me and Greg and CC stable the list of hashes. Yeah. So they correct it and backwards and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, we can give you then. Yeah, I think uh, Sasha uses ML, doesn't he? So he uses machine learning to um, certainly to do his auto sell stuff. So have you seen the. At any one time, you can have like 30 patches, uh, sorry, 300 patch set called auto sell. And I think he uses machine language to go and select those. So it's, it, it'll, be, uh, it'll be commits without a fixes tag, without CC and stable. And just go and churn through them. So anything that says, I fix this, I rectify that, and I presume it's certain keywords that he uses, they will then get back forwarded as part of his auto sell um, patch set. Uh, I'm assuming you could do something similar with this as well. Yeah, so I was checking a few other ones there. So, so for example, there is one. So picture a lot of those are from file systems. <laughs> so, uh, so the UDF, yes, the UDF one is actually a case where basically we have rewritten directory handling code and that has fixed some of the bugs. So it's kind of expected, but we didn't want to backport it to stable. Because oh, okay. like, it's kind of if you do subsystem rewrite, then yeah, it's kind of questionable whether you want that to be stable or not. So, because sometimes the known bugs are better than the new unknown ones. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's, that's kind of the trade of the distribution. I think we should add maybe some form or whatever, but you can just leave some comment like why it should not be recorded, just to keep some track. Of I, I think that'd be ideal. If we can, if there's some kind of feedback that we can give, like, I've talked to the maintainers, they're happy that this is an issue and they're going to stick with the issue rather than you know try and work through a fix. If we can mark those in Sysbot, that would be that would take a lot of work off my uh, backlog. Mm -hmm. Some sys text, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how you would implement it, but just like I've spoken to the maintainers, they're not going to fix it. Too risky, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And for example, this ext4 issue uh, that, that we know actually is mostly it's like look at that false positive yeah yeah there are, so, as i mentioned there are, for 5.15 it's around 65 percent are seem really correct i think i have months yeah. i may have misattributed some because i don't really have expertise in that code yeah, yeah, I yeah. for 6.1 the quality was pretty good actually 85 percent yeah, so, so this was actually so this is a correct report from sysbot like uh because we were literally getting log that reports about of inversions, but we did an analysis and con uh, concluded that yes, like the log that complains, but but the, the log is not really possible. Yeah, and so we 
uh, and so we like didn't see the stable kernel when we were actually chasing it because it was mostly a debugging annoyance. That is, uh, I think it, seems to, it would be nice to backport this because the people and we and other people I think keep on passing uh, older kernels and uh, just when you pass you probably don't want to duplicate that work mm. because it's, it would still look like a bug to everybody who has taken this LTS branch and has begun passing. Yeah, so, so this is kind of questionable. I understand you that for, for the automation and stuff like this, uh, I guess we can change the. So, so far, we were kind of, you know, conservative in that if we know it's not fixing the real bug, just, you know, this. It's just some changing some log dependencies or some yeah, so, assertions. So, I think it's better to backboard. Yeah, so this is not actually changed. Yeah, but the, the problem is that we have changed actually ah. how the code works. Yeah. Uh, because it was basically the lock it was taking was more or less pointless. So how we fixed this for the report was that we actually create some special functions that not taking the locks we wanted and then, then basically the lock that complaints went away. But uh, yeah, it, it's exactly the question like, do you want to take the risk this somehow inadvertently breaks something? But we didn't know if that could have broken anything. <laughs> but there is always some chance that we have missed something. Yeah. So, this is a question. On the one hand, you have most of the cosmetic problem of false positive log dip report, and on the other hand, you have possible breakage of real locking issue. Yeah, so that's why we kind of opted not to not to send it to state. Yeah. This is one of the forgotten ones. I should have. Yeah, this is. I should have CC this to state. Yeah, this is actually my my bug. This is, this is really. Yeah, no, you have <laughs> expertise in all those subsystems, and you can immediately understand. You, have, you know, every commit. Yeah, no, you know, I, I did uh, one of those commits. You know, yeah, so okay. I, I just <laughs> am paging in the context, but I, I, but I know what was. How could we edit or let you maybe add some comments or net, let these comments not be forgotten? Because like for everybody else, these look like backwards. Yeah, sure. And they don't have all the context like where it should not be backwarded. So if I send it to Sasha or Greg, they might you know, just if it applies, they can grab yeah, it. Yeah, you know, if you have uh, if you have some, yeah, probably on the web it's bad because you know, it's target for spam and stuff like this. Yeah, if you can if you can leave there some comments in the dashboards, yeah, or, or then then I guess it will, I I can like classify the at least a few one or like. You know, ten, 10 of those seem to be that I know enough about the changes because I was either writing them or reviewing them or merging them. So, <laughs> I already saw them fly by. So, uh, so I could probably comment on whether it makes sense to backport or not. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So this is this I don't understand. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyway, interesting work. Interesting work. Yeah, just the purpose statement should help us with this triage and those issues because when we, we do pass them internal little kernels and we see all that. Yeah, although I, I like the idea of fuzzing details because I think that would help to like similar as zero day actually does like compile testing of the patch sets on the mailing list. Yes, uh, so basically, I'm not sure if you know, but. So zero day testing done by Intel, they basically pick patches from the mailing lists mm -hmm. and do all the build tests on them even before they get my kernel testing bot or something. Yeah, yeah. Zero day bot is basically kernel testing bot. So what it does is it takes a kernel, yeah, uh, and it does compilation testing with all mod config and uh, also like various like predefined configs and then also randomizes the configs and tries to build with random config. And so on. It runs also some basic tests on it, like LTP uh, and, and similar test suites, basically. 
and they they not only do this on Linux Next, but although they monitor like some maintainer branches and do it on, do this on maintainer branches in Git, and they also monitor some mailing lists. And when there is like batches submitted to the mailing list, they like try to apply it. If it applies, you know they they, they run all this mm -hmm. basically suite of tests on it as well. Uh, so. And that helps exactly as you said. That helps with like hashing out these issues before the patches actually get merged. So the original developer actually has to address that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I, as a maintainer, you know, if I see the patch set in the mailing list and there is like zero day reply, you know, this doesn't build, you know, uh, this, this thing. Is, it, okay, I, I, so I will say okay. So. <laughs> I don't have to care about this patch set <laughs> after the guy fixes this. I'm going to spend my time reviewing it. Of, of course, sometimes, you know, usually it's ideal to, to run in parallel. So I, I do the review for like the architectural kind of thing and zero, and I rely on zero day for does it actually build. Yeah. So, uh, but but definitely it's useful because basically the developer does does the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then not, not the maintainer doesn't have to triage this and then then fix up and not find all errors. Yeah. So, 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 so I like the idea if, if you can do this for, for Sysbot, as you said, like, since you have the corpus of the tests, at least that could be maybe the first step that would be really, I believe really useful and really like good for reducing the, the load on the maintainers. Mm -hmm. Even like if the maintainers can somehow register, you know, their branch and you would like run the uh, you, you would run run your corpus of the tests on on the branch. That, that would be also great. I'm not sure how much like resource intensive that is, whether it is feasible. But we have to estimate how many actually. Uh, there was a plan that so far, maybe after the conference, I'll get some time to do it. Actually, we can parse these patch series and <laughs> to try to understand how many of the problems we could have caught by by actually running this corpus on this. Patch series. Mm -hmm. we, it's just an idea. We don't know how effective it would be. To, not only we yeah, uh, okay. justified by the number of resources, but it should also find something. Oh, of course, of course. Of course. But, but fuzzing it seems like an even bigger problem, I think. Sorry? Like fuzz, just fuzzing a patch seems to be even a more complicated problem. Like, why would you differentiate problems that appear because of it from the problems that appear that are on the kernel? For the patch series, but, but, so like, but it's, it's all the same issues that zero day is facing. Yeah, so maybe talk to those guys how how they are addressing it. They, on the build tests, or they also run some. So so they do uh, they do build tests, but they do also some regression tests.